Christians go admitted to heaven after they die. You might say, what a, a weird statement. Well, I mention it because it's sometimes it's only at the time when you lose a loved one that you begin to wonder what happens. And there's many different trains of thought and there's many different teachings. And I'm not here to state that someone else's view is wrong. I'm just here to share the view that I hold to. Does that make sense? And in sharing my view, I'm not saying all else is wrong. I'm telling you what I see from Scriptures and what I hold to, what I believe. It was only four weeks ago I was sharing with a friend and uh, they were sharing with me, you know, I believe that um, people who die aren't in heaven, but they're at a place of rest. And there's others I talk to who say, well, I believe that when people die, they're in a continuous sleep, that they're in their sleep. And so it was just, it's amazing how God prepares you sometimes before something happens. And it was when the family want to get together and say, well, where exactly is Bill? What's happening? Or where do Christians go the moment after they die? Is it immediately to heaven for the unsaved? And is it immediately to hell for those who are lost? Does the Bible say where the dead go and when? Well, let me just say this. A lot of it depends on whether or not you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. For those of us who are born again, for those of us who've been reborn, we know that there is a promise for us that is different to this world. In a sense, I'd say this. For those of us who are Christians, we are born twice. We might die a physical death, but we never die a spiritual death. In John 3, Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And the man he was speaking to marveled at that being in his 60s and being a religious man. He says, what does that mean? Must I re-enter my mother's womb? And he goes, no. That which is born of the water and that which is born of the Spirit. And sometimes people have incorrectly interpreted that to mean water baptism, but it's not. It's talking about the physical birth where the woman's water is broken. And it's talking about the spiritual rebirth. And he says there's a physical birth and there's the rebirth in the Spirit. And those who've never been born again they only experience a single birth, a physical birth, and a death where they're separated from God and knowing God's goodness. In Acts 4.12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people that we must be saved by. I had someone talking to me just at our camp, because we have our church camp on right now, and Pastor Brad is taking a service right now, and and uh, Sandra and I came back in the night hours as well as others. So I'm coming back this morning. And they're having a great time this morning, I know. And I was having a conversation and uh, I was talking to a gentleman whose family is very heavily involved in the Mormons. And uh, they said to me, you know, Pastor, you said from the platform once that if you talk to other religious groups, whoever they might be, and if you said, I only have one to two minutes left to live, can I get saved? And he says, and you said, they won't be able to give you salvation. So he said, I decided to try that with my mother and my father, who are very committed Mormons. He said, I wasn't sure how it worked, so I went to them. And he said to his parents, he's an older man, but he said to his parents, he says, uh, if I had a minute to two minutes live, could I be saved? And they said, no, you couldn't, because it's a process of works and things and proof. And he says, I was amazed at their response. And I said, but it goes different, my friend. He goes, what do you mean? And I said, ask them which Jesus they believe in. If I have Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or who else look at my door, I always make it pretty simple and straight. I don't have as many on my door these days, but straight to the door. And I say this, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they always tell me yes. And they'll even say born again because they got their lines pretty good. And I said, well, which Jesus? I was over at the Mormon area at Karawafa some years back and they wanted me to go on a tour and I, and, I, and I went on that tour and then I said, do you have any questions? And this was the, before they asked me to leave, okay? And I just asked that simple question. I says, which Jesus do you believe in? And there are 
flabbergasted, meaning, well, you're Jesus. And born again, I said, no, you're Jesus. The Jesus of Mormon has a brother called Satan. My Jesus has no brother called Satan. Just on that point is to say there is another foundation other than the one we believe. And then they escorted me out. But the fact of the matter is, or asked me to leave, whatever it was there. But the issue is this. The issue is this. There's only one way. In Acts 16, 30 to 31, it was Paul who was imprisoned and how God moved in the midst of tremendous pain. And it was the jailer who saw God move. And it says here, and as the jailer escorted Paul and Silas out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And it's salvation only in Christ. But what I love about Paul is that when you speak about life after death, Paul speaks with a certainty that if he would die, he'd be present with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, Paul wrote this. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. And we would rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. There's a separation of the body to the spirit and the soul. There's nowhere in this text where there's a time difference between death and being in the presence of God. In Paul's final days in 2 Timothy, he speaks about how death was near him. And whether he had overheard this from the gods or an angel of the Lord or through Christ himself, I don't know. But I knew that his time, or he knew that his time was coming to end. He'd be beheaded. And he wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. He says, For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who long for his appearing. Now, there's a couple of things that are worth noting here in Paul's words. First, he says that his departure is near. Okay? He could sense when his time was come. I think in some ways, Billy knew that his departure was near. There are two things that stand out for me that Bill was aware of his departure being near. One was a private discussion I had with him at my house a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was at my house. Pastor Shane was at my house. And Bill and I were having a conversation about his condition, his concern. And I won't go into the conversation because I don't think it's relative uh, to us here. But what I will say is this. He was aware that things might be coming to an end in this world. And the other area that spoke to me that perhaps Bill was aware was that on that day when Nolene was at work, what, around one o'clock, wasn't it? He sent a rather different type of message to Nolene. It wasn't the normal sort of message Bill would send. And just summarising it, perhaps not totally correct, but summarising it was this. I can't receive healing where I got the sickness. I can't be healed where I sick. And it was an unusual one that, and if you understand Nolene, it was, if Nolene's like, well, we'll talk about this later on, Bill, you know, we'll talk about the field. But in that area, as if to say, my full healing's gonna come, but not from here. From my own personal conversation with what Nolene sent me, his actual message, in the area there, I sometimes think that there's something happening spiritually that, the flesh and other things aren't aware of. But Paul understood this. He said, my departure is near. And he says, there's in store for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord will award to me on that day. And I like it when he says on that day because I asked the question, well, what day? Well, on that day that he is with the Lord. It wasn't like after so long sleeping or after so long being separated, but on that day there will be awarded to me this blessing. Paul could have modified this. He could have said this, at the Lord's return, I will receive the crown of righteousness. 
But he does it, he says, on that day, what day? On the day of my departure, I will be awarded this crown of righteousness. Someone said to me, well, you know, Pastor, after 2 Timothy, Paul also have a book afterwards called the book of Philemon and the book of Titus. Well, you need to understand that in both the New Testament and the Old Testament, things aren't always in chronological order, meaning as they should be. In fact, if you ever get what we call a chronological Bible, you'll be shocked to see that the, ver- the first verses, oldest verses, aren't actually Genesis at all. And you'll see it in chronological order. It's in the old and the new. But scholars and those would hold to the view that the last letter that Paul wrote was to Timothy. And we call that an epistle, which is a letter, and the prison epistle, meaning he's in jail. And this is when he said in the last part, my departure has come. In his midst of the sorrow of departure, it's also the joy of knowing that he is going to be somewhere better. I think of the Word of God in Luke chapter 16 when it talks about Lazarus and the rich man. Some people have dismissed this text of Scripture by saying it's a parable, and the parable means a story for single truth. But so many other scholars disagree with it as only being a parable because it specifically mentions Lazarus and it specifically mentions Abraham. And it talks about them dying and what happened. In Luke 16, 22 to 24, Jesus said this, And a time came when a beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried in Hades. Now, our English word we'd use for Hades is a word called hell. Hades is a Greek word. The Hebrew word is Sheol. And it's talking about a place that had two sections. One was a place of torment with a chasm, and the other place was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And this was a place where those, okay, who in Abraham's bosom lived, not for body, but soul and spirit. And those who knew not God or followed not God was in a place of torment. And I can think of no greater torment than what the Bible describes, how the rich men could look across the chasm and see Lazarus in peace and joy, and he wasn't. That's gonna be the greatest torment. It never says that Lazarus could look across and see, but it said those in torment could look across and see. And he says, and he looked up, the rich man, And he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now note, it doesn't say that they were asleep because there are those who hold to a doctrine that when you die, you sleep. In fact, it was Martin Luther who taught that when you die, you go into a continuous sleep. The only problem is there's no reference to it in the Bible. And they said, well, I I could think of a reference in Daniel 12.2. And in Daniel 12.2, it makes a statement Uh, that those in the dust are asleep. Well, it's talking about the physical body and sleep, rest. It's not talking about the soul and the spirit. In fact, uh, later on in John 5, I think it's verse 28, Jesus himself refers to that. He says, the dead and the dust will be resurrected. And that well can relate towards when Jesus died on the cross and it says, and the tombs and the graves opened and that certain number came up and walked amongst them who'd been buried, meaning they had, the spirit had come back into a body that was buried and come back out of the grave. But there's no mention of a soul sleep in this scripture that Jesus gives us in Luke 16. I wanna tell you something, that God's word is the most powerful truth we have in handling every and all situations. One of the scriptures that you always hear mentioned so much in the midst of a funeral or death is found in John chapter 14. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Verse one says this, your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And verse two, it says, in my father's house are many, what? Okay, say it again, are many what? Yeah, so the word mansion is actually incorrect, okay? There's no word in the original coin Greek that says mansions, okay? And if you're reading mansions, it's probably referring to the King James. So in the King James, okay, the translation is not taken 
from the original Greek. It's taken from what we call the Latin Vulgate. And when you translated the Greek, okay, and the Greek word here is meno, all right, which means to remain or stay. And when you translate the Greek word, meno, or stay, to Latin, it's called mansio. The word mansio means a traveler's resting place, which through the King James Bible has translated as a mansion. So therefore we have this doctrine amongst many believers that somehow in eternity or wherever, there's a street filled with these incredible houses. In fact, I can remember in the 70s uh, that people used to talk about, or in the 80s, what sort of mansion are you going to have? Are you going to have a big brick one, a little big one here, or, or who's going to have the biggest house and all those sort of things there? In the actual original language, there's no such thing. God's not talking about a physical building because how do I know? Because the Bible says in New Jerusalem, there's not even a temple or a church. So why is it that in the New Jerusalem in the future, there wouldn't be a temple or church where we have God's presence where we'd all be living in these big houses? It doesn't line up scripturally. What the scripture is actually talking about is in my father's house are many dwelling places, meaning there is a place for everyone who knows me to abide with me is what it's talking about. So the word mansion is incorrect in the language. You're more than welcome to disagree with me, but the Greek is still the Greek, okay? He's going to say, if not, I would have told you, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. Now, here's the wonderful thing. There are those who hold to the belief, and I respect that, okay, that when you die, you're still in that place in the bowels of the earth that we would have called Hades, Sheol, or if you want to use another word, hell, okay? Okay meaning that on one side are those who are in torment and the other side is a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Now, I don't hold to that view. I hold to the view that there is a place of torment, but the place that was called Abraham's bosom paradise is empty. You say, well, hang on a minute. I've got scriptures to quote to you. Okay, that's great. Quote your scripture. Well, what about the thief on the cross? What about the thief on the cross? Well, the thief on the cross, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in what? Paradise, which is Abraham's bosom. That's right. So let me bring to you this. This is before Jesus conquered the grave. Before Jesus conquered the grave, he did not have the authority over the grave. Well, I don't agree with you. Well, just read your Bible. In Luke chapter four, when Jesus was being tempted, the devil said, if you will but worship me, all this authority I have, I can give to anybody I want. In fact, the time in which we see Jesus says he has all authority is after his resurrection. In Matthew 28, verse 18, before the Great Commission in verse 19, Jesus says, all authority and power has been given unto me. That's verse 18. Then verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. If you hold to a group where you're predominantly Old Testament versus New Testament, then the biggest battle you have is understanding the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus. One of the classic examples I see is when Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 60. When you read Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 60, you remember that Stephen is the first Christian martyr. And when he's been taken out and he's about to be stoned and killed, it says this in verse 55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open, not closed. I see heaven open and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, the crowd covered their ears and they yelled at their voices and they all rushed at him and dragged him out of the city, began to stone him. And it's little wonder why they'd be angry because it goes against old covenant of what they predict as shawl or death. Now remember, we're talking about a new covenant. It says, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul while they were stoning him. And Stephen prayed, 
Jesus received my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this in against him. When he said this, he fell asleep. And falling asleep means his body ceased, not his spirit. There's no mention of soul sleep. In fact, as Stephen was dying, he saw heaven opened and there was Christ at the right hand of God with an open heaven and looking up, it was received my spirit. I hold to a view that when we die, we are with him. Paradise before the death and resurrection was empty of Christ's presence. After his death, Christ's presence infiltrated what was. And we who die are in his presence. So you say, well, why can't I be in this paradise in the bowels of the earth with Christ's presence? Because my Bible says, as Stephen says, he saw heaven opened, he saw the throne of God, he saw Christ at the right hand of God, and heaven was open. And on this he said, receive my spirit. That's what I hold to, that's what I believe. Now, you're entitled to believe whatever you want. That's one of the novelties of the areas. What's always important is scriptural basis for our belief and what we have. But this is the promise, that we who know Christ will be at peace. We who know Christ will come into his abode and will be gathered together. And there'll be a time when Christ will ascend. And the Bible says those who have gone before us will be gathered with him. And we who are left will be called up into the clouds and we will experience the resurrection and the coming of the Lord. This is that great day that we await and that we look forward to. So when I think of my friend Bill, I think of a body that is no longer is relative. It is now asleep, finished, done its course. In the same way that when Christ died and was bound and laid in the tomb, and even though his body was removed, when he came back, he wasn't identified as to how he looked. It was new. This body is but a shell. It is the spirit that separates us from the beasts of this world. It's the spirit that acknowledges a higher call. It's that spirit that's connected with Christ. And it's that promise that we have as believers that we're reunited. Someone said to me, well, Hebrews 12, 1, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of those who've gone before us. Would Bill be one of those? Of course. Can he interact with us? No. But the Lord sends his spirit to interact with us the Holy Spirit, who comes in the name of the Lord to minister, to comfort, and to abide. So we who are left are left with the promise of the Lord. I've already prepared a way for you. And preparing a way means it's a different way, that he would die and be resurrected and pave a way for which you follow. With the thief on the cross, Jesus was gonna go down into that paradise for three days would go to hell. And he said, today you'll be with me in that place, not torment, you'll be with me. But for those who died after the resurrection, Paul, who believed, okay, uh, in that day he would receive. Stephen, who said that in that moment he saw heaven opened, he saw the throne of God, he saw Christ. Is it any wonder why when he described that it caused chaos amongst the religion because it was the religious who couldn't accept that? To say that they're just an eternal sleep even goes against on the Mount of Transfiguration because on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says two people were there with Jesus. Do you remember who those two people were? Moses and Elijah. If they're in a continuous sleep, they couldn't be there with Jesus. I want to encourage you today this. You need to live today right with God. 
You need to live today with God. John Wesley was once asked, if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do differently? And John Wesley infamously said, I would do nothing different because I live every day as if he's coming back tomorrow. I see today where so many Christians are battling with their walk with God. We have allowed the momentary things to overwhelm us. Like that, we could be taken from this world into God's presence. Just like that. That's how it was almost with Bill. Like that. Nolene just heard a, a groan and then basically it was gone. And as they said to Joshua, there's nothing you could have done. It was done. Like that. I wonder if you knew like that something was going to happen to you, what you would change. Would you say, well, I know that's coming. I'd better be at prayer a bit more. I know that's coming. I better be more consistent or involved. I know that's coming. I better forgive. I know it's coming. But you know, when I think of Bill, I don't know anybody who was ill-placed with him. I don't know anyone. I mean, if you know, I mean, last Sunday, Bill was here. I prayed with him down over there. He was here. What aches my heart is not where he is, but just the length of time I have before I see him again. Then again, being a pastor, Bill's not my first person that I've loved that's gone to glory. In fact, for me, there's an awful lot. When I think of Bill, I think of not only family or friends, but I think of others I know that he has joined. And these are a great cloud of witnesses. So if I take Hebrews 12 verse 1 and it says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses with those who have gone before us, I think of Bill's witness or his testimony. But you know what the word witness means in the Greek, Josh? You want to have a guess what the word witness means? It means martyr. The word witness in Greek means martyr or martyrdom. The word witness isn't merely you telling someone about Jesus, but the actual word witness in Greek means martyr. That's where we get our word martyr from, martyr. Meaning this, I'm prepared to live my life so I can die well for him. So when I think of that scriptures in Hebrews 12, 1, that we were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I think of those who said, I give my life. Whether they give their life by a sword, where they gave their life of old age like Abraham, where they gave their life like Isaiah who was sawn in two by an unrighteous king, putting him in the log, or where they gave their life because their physical body could no longer contain them. But to me, they're a witness or a martyr for the glory of God. If it had been you that went to be with the Lord, this week. Have you given me the right to speak about you in the same way? Have you given me the ability to say the right thing? That you've kept the faith. That you fought the good fight. Fight that you finished the race. I think if I knew what Bill knew, meaning what was said to him, is there anything I would do differently? Well, Nolan, I'd like to think there is one thing I would like to have done differently. May I say that? And I've been saying this for years. You know what that is? I want to do a video. I'm serious. I pray like, and I want to be able to say, 
if you're watching this now, it means I've gone home. No, I'm serious. I asked Trevor Chandler to do that, but he didn't feel comfortable. But I really want to do that. If you're watching this now, it means I'm not here. I've gone home. Don't weep for me to come back. But by all means, lament and weep because of that break. We should never be embarrassed about lamenting or weeping. You know, if a loved one goes overseas, you weep. You know you're going to see me again, but you weep. Well, we know we're going to see each other again, so it doesn't mean Christians don't weep. Of course we weep. I remember when my dad died, I said to my wife and son, you know, that was 12 years ago, I said, I'm going to go in this room, and I'm going to shut the door, and you're going to hear noise. Now, I don't want you to disturb me. I don't want you to come in. I don't want you to be worried about me, and I don't want you to think I've gone nuts. I just want you to let me grieve. You know what she said to me afterwards? I'm glad you warned us. (laughs) It's about the process. It's the healing. It's the things you need to work through. It's those things. It's a part of it. So we weep as a church. There's nothing ungodly about that. We lament. We wail. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the same breath, we rejoice on his witness. It's martyrdom. And we rejoice that we will meet again. And we rejoice his testimony. And we should be inspired yes. that we will do the same. 30 years of marriage. 35 years in total of relationship. How beautiful that is. But it's not divorce that separated you from your husband. It's not a physical earth distance. It's a departure. But we'll be reconnected. And that's why we as believers have hope that does not disappoint. We bow our heads right now. Father, in your name, I know as the word of God says, in the moment and the twinkling of an eye, the trump shall sound. And we shall be called up to meet with him in the clouds. That glorious day, Lord, in which you come for decades, Christians have prayed that that'd be the generation that would experience it. Some because of the ecstasy of the joy and some because of the fear of death. I don't know. You could come today. You could come tomorrow. You may well not come in my lifetime. So I have decided that I'll live every day as if you're coming now. That my commitment, that my desire, that my acts of service, that my witness, the giving of my life, even though there are many other things that pull on me and demand of me, the day-to-day runnings or the hurt or the disappointments, demand of me not to be so, I have determined. As the Apostle Paul says, what shall separate me from the love of Christ? Tribulation or sword or famine? Thieves? Pain? What shall separate me? An angel that's false of another doctrine? What shall separate me from the love of God? As Paul said, I have determined that nothing shall separate me. And so, Lord, Bill has determined that nothing would separate him. And so, Lord, I pray what would be seeded in us through his death, a seed that says, live every day unto the Lord. Forgive quick. Laugh much. Shine your light continuously. Guard your tongue. Think good rather than bad of each one. And glorify the King. For we know not when we are called home.